How do you do? I'm Captain James Ferris, Commander Carrier Air Group 4. It's my privilege to welcome you aboard. The film you are about to see is concerned with two principal factors in the carrier landing equation, the pilot and the landing signal officer. The responsibility for the execution of a safe and efficient approach to landing a board ship is divided between these two. That responsibility becomes greater each year as the unit cost of our Navy aircraft continues to spiral. We have seen great changes wrought in the aircraft carrier environment and methods of operation in recent years. Angled decks, steam catapults, constant runout arresting gear engines, optical landing systems, swept wing aircraft, sonic boom dives, and more recently, boom climbs. Now we see innovations like boundary layer control, automatic landing systems, and automatic power compensators coming in. All of them designed to ease the problem of bringing the airplane aboard. These devices help the pilot directly, and in so doing, they afford some additional help to the landing signal officer. But in the final analysis, he, the LSO, is on his own as he has ever been in rendering the irrevocable decision, the wave off, or acceptance of the aircraft for landing. The landing signal officer has a unique status in carrier aviation. During my years as an active carrier pilot, I have conducted a running skirmish with many of them. But underneath the veneer of needling and jocularity and sometimes damaged pride, there has always been a heavy vein of respect for this man, this pilot, this landing signal officer. There are some bad days on this job the kind that make you wonder why you ever put in for it. And the nights can be worse. Of course, everybody has them. In the cockpit or on the ground. But there are no mosquitoes in the cockpit. There are days and nights when, as an LSO trainee, you feel that you've been miscast for the job. And maybe you should have stuck strictly to flying. What did he do wrong? Uh, he looked low in the groove and high at the ramp. No, he was on glide slope, but he was using too much power. That's what uh, caused him to go high at the ramp. You observe, evaluate, and learn. You learn that a touchdown that is short of the landing area can be caused by dropping your nose in the groove, as well as by taking off too much power. You find that you can learn the job only as an apprentice training for whatever number of hours are necessary to develop the judgment and temperament that will earn you the confidence of your fellow squadron members. You learn to reduce the natural human tendency to chip too much on the radio. Inexperienced pilots can become too dependent on it. Experienced pilots don't need it. No two landings are alike, just as the personalities of each pilot are different. Roger Ball. A little high, a little too much power. Eventually, you get accustomed to making instantaneous decisions until your responses become automatic. To use the few available seconds to direct, evaluate, and record. Wave off, a little high, a little too much power. Roger, ball. When working with new pilots, the LSO must find a way to build confidence in the man who is flying, and at the same time, maintain high standards of performance. This is reflected by our communication with less experienced pilots during practice landings. 409, paddles, over. 409, roger. It wasn't too bad of an approach. You're having a little trouble with your starting position. You're carrying too much power out of your turn and going high in the groove each time. Let's move our 180 out, then you won't have to fly such a wrapped up approach and carry all the excess power. 409, roger. By observing and correcting basic flying errors, the LSO can often help the young pilot sharpen his flying skills and sometimes build his confidence at the same time. Our debriefings of less experienced pilots follow the same logic. The debriefings are necessarily complete and quite thorough. Seemed like the big problem out there the other day, and I don't have to tell you all that you weren't flying the glide slope, was your airspeed control at the start. Too much power out of your turn, late taking it off, 
Getting fast. You get a good start, half your problem's already whipped. And Ron, today your 180 position was off. You were way too close to beam. Having to carry too much power through your turn. And Tom, well, your first three passes were OK. But as the hop went along, the aircraft got a little lighter on you. And as you rolled into final, you were late, just a few seconds late, getting set up and taking your power off to start your rate of descent. And you went, you got accelerating here and got fast, and also went high. And then all the way down here, you're trying to work that off, back on the power, up on the power. And finally, when you got in here close, the only way I could have gotten you down was to shoot you down. <laughs> so let's watch this. We get aboard ship. The thing we aim for start, in debriefing of less experienced start, pilots stay is to correct bad flying practices the before they become habit. And before the deck gets fouled with a million dollars worth of aircraft parts. All of our training, as pilots and as landing signal officers, comes into focus aboard the carrier. Here, both the pilot and LSO can be grateful for modern equipment landing aids and the coordinated action of all the highly trained deck crews. It takes some doing, as aircraft get faster, heavier, and less maneuverable near the stalling speed, to bring them down on an unstable deck. The margin for error is narrowing, and we need all the electronic and mechanical aids available. The angled deck itself provides for a safer landing strip, with the island and parked aircraft well out of the way. look at the recovery from our vantage point on the LSO's platform. The LSO and at least one assistant man the platform, wave off switch in hand, and radio handset tuned to the land launch frequency. With the deck crew on station, we're ready to receive you on board when the air boss gives the word. Your Phantom 2 is in the pattern, ready to make the approach turn. Give the backwash to Charlie now. Set the gear for Phantom. The air boss has cleared you for landing. Lens and arresting gear settings for your type aircraft are being made and checked. Upon completing the turn on to final, you have about a mile, or 20 to 25 seconds, to establish your angle of attack, line up and center the meatball for an okay approach. You're rolling out in the groove. Last check. All down. Get that donut on the indexer and hold it. There's the meatball. 104, meatball. Roger, ball. Get the meatball centered. Check the lineup. Donut. Meatball. Keep it going. You're on the money with number three wire. Because time could be the most critical factor in accomplishing recoveries in a wartime mission, our techniques include closely monitoring the interval between aircraft in the recovery pattern. We have found that a closely monitored pattern improves air discipline and airmanship and results in a smartly executed recovery. Since it only takes one man to completely disrupt an entire recovery pattern, we monitor his turning point as well as his altitude. Many of the corrections required on the glide slope are the direct result of errors made earlier in the approach. In judging correct power settings on the approach, we depend on both sight and sound. For instance, some engines have a characteristic pitch, like the sound of the F-4 Phantom. Too much power, the engine pitch will be higher. 
the power is too low, the sound will have a distinctively lower pitch. We notice the jet exhaust smoke. It increases as power is added. It decreases as power is taken off. We also learn to make instantaneous judgment by the configuration of various aircraft as seen from the platform. There's a speed gouge for each aircraft. The situation where the LSO pilot relationship becomes more personal can happen suddenly during an emergency. Here, the pilot and the LSO work together even more closely as a team. One, two, this is paddles again. Don't get hit in the ties with looking at this barricade. You know, keep that normal scan going. It's, uh, it's the only way you can guarantee yourself a successful engagement. Okay. I-612, about 1,500 pounds, Paul. Roger, Paul. Landing signal officer is proud of his job and the confidence and support he receives from his command. We find there's a special dividend in the job in terms of personal satisfaction. But there's a plus factor in the LSO job that makes it attractive to most of us. We like to fly and we're encouraged to fly several types of aircraft. Many LSOs fly three or four. We believe our LSO duties help to make us better pilots. I've said that the LSO enjoys a unique status in our Corps. Show me an officer with Lieutenant JG or Lieutenant Stripes whose approval is sought by every squadron pilot. Show me a young officer to whom squadron commanders and air group commanders level a particular kind of deference and to whom skippers listen with concentration. Show me a back a little bit straighter, an eye more clear, and a sunburn more pronounced than most, and I'll show you a landing signal officer, an all-important cog in the great machine that is carrier aviation.